Tina Levine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I actually, he told me he was going to play that song, and then I heard it on the way here on my drive. So I was like, okay, God, I think uh, you're preparing me for this, right? So it's a great song. I love the lyrics. I love all the words to that song. And sometimes you just hear songs that it really touches your heart, and that was definitely one of them. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you all for being here. I know you guys are busy, and it's a Saturday night, and you probably had a lot of things to do out on the town, so I appreciate you coming. <laughs> uh, so my name is Tina uh, Miller-Levine, and I actually was born and raised in Central America, Ohio. Uh, so I actually uh, have done Christian comedy, and I actually shared that joke in Tampa in front of a, a church of leaders. They were doing an appreciation dinner, so they brought me in uh, to, to share some comedy and make them laugh. And I said that joke, and then uh, I said, well, actually, if I was Hispanic, my name would be Latina. And this woman in the front row says, that's my name. <laughs> And it was the pastor's wife. So it was hilarious. I was like, wow. That, like sometimes when you do comedy, it just, it, it, it's just, you know, God's like, he writes all the material for us, right? It, it makes it easy. So uh, I appreciate y'all being here. And I, I love sharing my story. But more than that, what I love to do is to tell his story. And that's what this is about. This is about praising God and giving, it, giving him all the glory. Uh, because I'm just a willing vessel. <laughs> and that's what you're going to hear with my testimony. Is, and I'm just a willing vessel. I'm just like, I'm blind and I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to follow you. Okay? So I'm going to try to, uh, to go with my slides as much as possible. So when um, Brian had asked me what the title of this was, I was like, wow, I think walking blindly by faith and not drowning is pretty appropriate, okay? So I, I brought my son up actually in faith, and, uh, and my son said to me when he was 18 months old, he says, Mama, we need to talk about my life. And I was like, oh, God, <laughs> what did you give me? <laughs> you know, he was just so wise for his age, and I'll share a little bit about his story and how he was just a, a divine appointment, let me tell you, a, a, tier, a total miracle. Um, but one of the things I remember my son saying to me at five years old is he said, Mama, you have to be like Peter, keep your eye on Jesus and walk on the water. Five years old, my son was ministering to me. And so that's what I always think about is how we walk blindly and we're walking on water, you know. And if we take our eyes off of Jesus, we're going to fall into that water and we're going to struggle. And how often do we, we spend more energy and time on our pain and we forget what our purpose is? Uh, so if you are to walk away from anything today, I, I just want you to walk away with this, that there is hope, no matter what you're going through. If you've had a medical diagnosis, if you've had something happen, you lost a job or, or got divorced or, you know, bankruptcy or, or a repo, I'm giving you my whole history here, <laughs> infertility, I, I lost a child. I mean, I, I have been through it all and I'm telling you there is hope. So don't quit before the miracle happens. God has an awesome plan for you. Um, so the next slide is actually, hello, my name is. Uh, so I actually, I was born in Ohio, and I had an older sister. Where's the older siblings in here? Any older siblings? Okay, well, thank you for you all, uh, because you talked for us younger ones. My sister talked for me. She was four years older than me. I didn't have to talk till I was three years old. My sister talked for me. I haven't quit talking. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of fun. Uh, so I actually, I, I, I was always known as Michelle's sister. My sister's an incredible artist. Anyone have a sibling like that? They're really gifted, really talented, outgoing, outspoken. And I kind of stood in the shadow of my sister's fame. <laughs> and, and she's still a very successful artist to this day. Uh, but I always kind of sat in the background. I didn't talk till I was three years old. I actually didn't have a voice uh, and didn't really find my voice until later in life. And now that's what I speak about, is finding your voice and allowing it to be God and that he speaks through us. Uh, so today I would say, hello, my name is, number one, I'm a child of God. 
Number one, I'm a child of God. Number two, I'm a, a woman in long-term recovery from addictions. Uh, number three, I am a cherished and treasured daughter of the one true king. And, and I believe that today. And, and that's amazing. What an amazing feeling. Uh, so if you're sitting here and you're wondering, you know, who am I and what am I and what's my name? I, I ask you, you know, just look at the promises in the Bible. Look at those promises because God calls you treasured. He calls you cherished. He calls you the one true child of his and that he'll protect you and he'll love you. Uh, so I, I just, I like to share that. Um, I love this. Because I don't know about you, but it says, rejoice for me, with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. So at seven years old, I'll back up. Okay, so the first four years of my life, my father was an alcoholic. And uh, he had actually four DUIs in the 70s. Four DUIs in one month. Like, in the 70s, you know, back then they kind of like, oh, geez, they didn't throw stuff at you. But uh, back then they kind of slapped your hand, right? It was like, just get home, you know? <laughs> they pulled you over for being drunk. My dad had four DUIs in one month. Uh, so he was an alcoholic the first four years of my life. And so uh, it wasn't until uh, he started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. So my first AA meeting was at four years old. I should have stayed. But <laughs> I went off and did my own thing and had to qualify myself for Alcoholics Anonymous later in life. But uh, I'm so grateful that my dad took me to Alcoholics Anonymous because for me, that was my first exposure to 12-step recovery. And these people loved me. These people cared about me. And they really brought my dad back to life. Um, also, my dad found his faith in Alcoholics Anonymous, which then I did later as well. At seven years old, my best friend was kidnapped, raped, and murdered. At that point in my life, I made God irre irrelevant in my life. I thought if there was a God, he would not kill my best friend. She was missing for three days, and I was walking through the woods looking for her dead body. At seven years old. To this day, when I step on acorns or dried leaves, it reminds me of that time of looking for my friend's dead body. She was missing for three days. The killer was actually someone we knew. Now, back in the 80s, you heard stranger danger, stranger danger. Well, this wasn't a stranger. We all knew who killed her. He admitted to it. Took the police to her body and everything. At that point, I had survivor guilt. And I share that story because someone in here may be struggling right now with survivor guilt. Maybe someone had passed away unexpectedly in your life. Maybe you were at war. You don't have to be in war, at war to, to have post-traumatic stress disorder. You don't have to go to war to have any type of trauma. You know, you don't even have to experience rape or abuse or domestic violence to really have trauma or PTSD. You can actually hear about it or you can see it and you still can have those effects. I know this today after many, many years of therapy <laughs> in support groups. I understand this today. Um, so I love this I love this Luke 15, 6 because, and I'll share a little bit more of my testimony. So I, I became an atheist at seven years old, and I didn't find God then until I was uh, 2002. I didn't accept Jesus into my heart until 2002. Uh, so that was many, many years of darkness, many, many years of being lost. You know, and I still get chills thinking about how he left the 99 for that one. And I was that one. Whew, that's humbling, right? I love this. When you're hanging on by a thread, make sure it's the hem of his garment. I love all the miracles of healing in the Bible. And if you look at the man that was on the rug, and he was in pain, and he was suffering for 20-some years, correct? And, and he's sitting on that rug, and he's watching people go into the pool, and they, they're getting healed, and he's sitting there, and he, oh, look, there goes another one. They're getting healed. I'm not getting healed. And what did Jesus say? Get up. Get up. The woman was bleeding for, what, 15 years, bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. What did she do? She reached for his helm. So you have to take action in order to get reaction. In order for God to bless you with a healing, you have to take action. 
And so that's what I've learned throughout the Bible, is that I have to take action. You know, faith without works is dead. And so if, we, if we're not walking in our faith, and sometimes blindly, a lot of times blindly, especially me, if I'm not walking in that faith, I can't expect a miracle to happen. And he has lots and lots of miracles. So throughout my testimony, I hope that's what you're gonna gather today, is that there are so many miracles that God has performed in my life, and he has so many miracles to perform in your life as well. You may be struggling, but keep declaring, I'm blessed, I'm favored, I'm loved, amen, right? So let's say that real quick together. I am blessed, I am favored, and I am loved. Amen, that's right. Say it like you mean it. Amen. <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I wanted to share that real quick because um, one of the things that I, um, I realized uh, early in my life is uh, after many years of abuse and domestic violence and being raped and all of that before the age of 18, uh, I, my addiction spiraled out of control because what I was doing is I was using addictions to numb the pain. And that's usually what happens. See, there's a stigma on the streets. There's a stigma in society that when you see someone who is abusing drugs or alcohol, that, oh, they're just a junkie. Oh, they just, they're selfish. Oh, they're just acting a fool. And what's happening is they're actually in so much pain, many, many times, and hurt, they're trying to numb themselves. Because to be drunk or high is more acceptable in their chaotic world than it is to be sober and living a life of recovery. And so until they learn the tools to actually be healthy and to transform that trauma into purpose, you know, that's what I always say, transforming that pain into purpose. And that's exactly what God did for me, is he took all the pain that I had and he transformed it into purpose. I was in college, and I was 19 years old. I had just smoked a bunch of marijuana and drank a bunch of alcohol. I ended up in the emergency room, and they thought I was about to die. I had to be hooked up to all these heart monitors and everything. And I remember getting released from the emergency room, them calling my parents and saying, you know, we don't know what happened. She's walking out of here, had heart monitor on still. I walked home from the emergency room, and what did I do? I hit that marijuana pipe again, and I started drinking again. Because in my head, life would be much better if it just ended. And that's where I was at. That's where my addictions had taken me. I just wanted to die in the process of everything. But I was also a people pleaser. So I really, really wanted to treat other people like gold. And I wanted to treat them really good. But at the same time, I wasn't treating myself that, right, that way at all. One of the things I've learned in recovery is to treat yourself like your own best friend. And I do that today. I got a manicure and a pedicure yesterday. <laughs> you know, I just love when they're like rubbing your feet. I'm like, oh, man, I'll pay anybody a bunch of money just for that. You know, <laughs> that's some great stuff. And then they actually paint your nails and toenails. It's like great, you know. So today I treat myself like my own best friend. But there was a time, and I'll give you an example there was a time I would get gift cards for my birthday or Christmas. And what would I do with those gift cards? I would buy other people gifts. Anyone ever do that? Yeah, where's the people pleasers out there? Codependent? Yeah, yeah, hey, thank you for being brave and being honest. There's lots of others too. They're just not raising their hand. <laughs> but seriously, for me, that was an eye-opener. Like here I am using my gift to buy other people gifts. That's very, very codependent and people-pleasing. And, you know, that was a gift for me. So I've actually had to learn, okay, I can treat myself, and I'm worthy of that gift. And so that is something I've learned in recovery. That's a miracle in itself. So actually, so I'm in, uh, I'm in college. I failed nine classes. This is not something I'm proud of. And I still owe my dad a bunch of money. <laughs> my dad always jokes around and he says, you know, you say you never blacked out, but I remember this one time you must have blacked out because I told you you're going to owe me for every class you failed. <laughs> like, oh, wow, I must have blacked out then. <laughs> so I failed nine classes. A, a couple of those classes, bowling, dinosaurs, 
<laughs> the math and a bunch of other classes. But I guess you're supposed to go to class or you fail. So I actually, I get kicked out of college. Now, mind you, I'm just drinking and using drugs and, you know, not going to classes. It was a big party. My parents did the hardest thing that they had to do, and they told me, you're cut off. My dad says, I'm not going to pay to watch you die. And I was, oh, I was mad. Oh, how could you do that to me? Oh, I was so mad at them, and I didn't talk to them for six months. Oh, I hope they think I'm dead. I was so angry at them and resentful. But what were they doing? They were saving my life. It was the hardest decision for my parents to cut me off financially. But what it made me do is I had to get jobs then to actually afford my addictions. And what I realized was I can't afford my addictions. And so at 23 years old, well, let me back up. Okay, so when I was kicked out of college at 22 years old, I, I wrote a letter. I quit doing drugs because I thought that was my problem. I was drunk. I write a letter to Dean. I thought his name was Dean <laughs> at the university. I said, Dean, I'm drunk. It's on a notebook piece of paper with pencil. Dean, I quit drugs. I'm kicked out of college. Please let me back in. Tina. It, it was all scribbled. I mean, I, I don't have nice handwriting anyways. Those of you who bought my books, I'm sorry. If I need to translate, just let me know. I have horrible handwriting, but can you imagine? I'm drunk, and I'm writing this letter to Dean. Uh, and so Dean actually has some grace for Tina, and he allows me back in to college on academic probation. I always joke around. I was on, academic, I was on probation five of my six years. <laughs> Uh, it was academic probation. I never got caught for any other stuff. Um, so I, I actually, I, I, go, I go back um, to college and, and to this one class. And I walked into this class and the professor looks at me. She says, who are you? And I said, I'm Tina. Now remember when I was little, I didn't have a voice. Remember, I was abused. I was raped. Domestic violence. I was a victim. I didn't have a voice. She says, Tina, it's your lucky day. You're going to do a classroom presentation. <laughs> Are you kidding me? She says, where have you been the last six weeks? I'm uh, 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 drunk and high. And she's like, okay, great. You're going to do a classroom presentation. <gasps> oh, gosh. Are you kidding me? And so she says, it, it's, uh, this is a child development class. It's going to be about your childhood. Oh, she, she was about to regret that. And so each classmate goes up and they do their presentation. And the first girl goes up and, and she goes to read hers. And she's like, how children learn to say the alphabet. Everyone starts clapping, yay, after her presentation. Another young lady goes up there. She says, how children learn to tie their shoes. <laughs> I go up there. How kids deal with the murder of their best friend. And it was silence. And, and then someone gasped. <gasps> and then you could hear tears as I start to share my story. First time I ever shared what had happened to me. First time I ever shared that I had survivor guilt because my friend was murdered. And I felt like it was my fault. And I felt like it should have been me and not her. First time I ever had a voice. Everyone's crying. The professor's crying. She was this beautiful Christian woman. And I'll never forget, she says, Tina, I need to see you after class. Now, at this point, because I had been hurt so bad, I had built up a huge brick wall around me. And when someone would have any confrontation with me, my first thought, because my dad taught me, he was, you know, he actually earned two Purple Hearts in Vietnam, um, and he is my hero to this day. But he taught me how to break people's arms, okay? So this professor says to me, I want to see you after class. So what am I thinking? The first thing I'm thinking is how I'm going to get up there, I'm going to break her arm and get her on the ground. That's what I'm, th that's how sick I am, okay? Because in my head, if I hurt you first, you can't hurt me. That's how sick I was. I was hurting. And hurt people hurt people. But I'm telling you today, heal people can heal people. All because of him. And so this, this beautiful Christian professor, she says to me, honey, what's your major? 
I said, interior design. She said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> she said, you need to work with children. And I said, ooh, I don't even like kids. <laughs> I wanted to make money. <laughs> she said, no, 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 you need to work with children. She said, your purpose and what you've been through, God created you. That's your purpose. Is to, you're, you're to work with children. You know, at, at this time in my life, it was the only person that gave me hope, that took time with me and believed in me. I literally ran from her classroom to my academic advisor and changed my major like that. I had already done two years of interior design. Well, ba basically, I mean, I, I failed nine classes. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> Maybe a month of interior design. But anyways, so I changed it to family and child development. And I went straight into social work. So I go into social work and... Uh, and it, it's just amazing how, how God worked it all out because, you know, I thought the drugs were my problem. Uh, and then, actually, the last month I drank, January 1998, I did everything I said I would never do when I was drinking. I drove drunk. I went to the bar by myself drunk. Uh, I, I drank by myself. But I was a wine drinker because, you know, alcoholics don't drink wine. <laughs> and it was classy. It was the boxed wine. Very classy. Uh, so I, I actually, I had switched my alcoholic drinks, like a good alcoholic. You know, I went from hard liquor to natural light, the classy stuff, and then uh, the boxed wine. Uh, because, you know, if you're a female, 23 years old, and you're drinking boxed wine, you can't be an alcoholic, right? Uh, wrong. <laughs> so I actually, what I had learned, I was going to Al-Anon, and I started to work the 12 steps. And I started to realize, wow, I got some issues <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was all my dad's fault. I was like, oh, he really screwed us up. <laughs> and then what I found out was I am an adult and I'm responsible for what it is I'm going through. And I'll never forget in Al-Anon, it's another 12-step recovery program, and they suggested you find a sponsor. And so I'm looking around the room like, who's going to be my hostage? <laughs> and I see this woman and she's just the happiest thing. She's just full of energy and joy, and she's so happy, and I'm like, I just wanted to puke, and her name was Lenora, isn't that beautiful, so I go up to Lenora, you look pretty happy, you want to be my sponsor, she, oh, oh, I would be so blessed to be your sponsor, she has no idea, <laughs> okay, lady, <laughs> like fasten your seatbelt, right, uh, so anyways, Lenora starts to uh, call me every day. I'm like, whoa, hold on, lady, we just met. <laughs> and she says, I want you to call me every day, and I want you to tell me five things you're grateful for. And I was like, oh, wow, I hate this woman already. <laughs> that is disgusting. Really? I am not grateful for anything. But what Lenora taught me is to have an attitude of gratitude. And she literally changed my thinking. Because here I was a victim and after a while, a victim starts to volunteer to be a victim. And when you have that victim mentality, it's this vicious cycle. And you're always going to be a victim, okay, until you change to an attitude of gratitude and you realize, wow, I'm blessed. And I started to do that every day. I would call Lenora, and I swear she would write this down. And she'd be like, um, I'd call her, I'd say, okay, Lenora, um, I'm grateful for um, air. And she'd go, oh, well, actually, September 13th at 3 o'clock p.m., you said that already. So try another one. Was, oh, my gosh, this lady was insane. But what she made me do is she made me realize how grateful I should be every day. Number one, if I have air, if I have breath, it's a blessing. And that's what we're talking about. I'm blessed, I'm favored, and I'm loved. And that's what Lenora taught me, and that's what the 12-step recovery program taught me. I soon discovered, okay, I am an alcoholic, and so I started to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. My first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting was with my father. I went to his house, I knocked on the door, and he opened the door, and he's like, whoa, you're still alive. I said, yep. He says, how can I help you? I said, it's Tuesday night. Are you going to your meeting? He says, yeah. Why? I said, well, Dad, I, I think I'm a pickle. And he goes, oh, does that mean you like girls? <laughs> <laughs> no, not a lesbian. I said, I'm a pickle. I, I was a cucumber. I had too much juice. Now I'm a pickle. <laughs> you get it? 
<laughs> I couldn't say I was an alcoholic. I was 23 years old. I couldn't say I was an alcoholic, so I'm a pickle. I actually, that name tag, hello, my name is, I put pickle on my name tag for the first six months in Alcoholics Anonymous. Everyone thought my name was pickle. To this day, old men still send me pickles, little pickle pins. I have one in my car. <laughs> it's a big joke, Heinz pickle. I have pickles all over my Christmas tree. My son's like, what, what is that? Well, thank God it's like a German tradition, I guess, to have a pickle on your Christmas tree, or it would be kind of creepy. <laughs> But I was called a pickle. Everyone, when I go to Ohio to Alcoholics Anonymous meeting to this day, people still call me pickle. But anyway, so I get into Alcoholics Anonymous and and I start doing, so I I was told to take everything, all the time and energy I put into my addictions and transform that into my recovery. And that's what I did. The first 90 days of my sobriety, I attended 116 meetings first 90 days. I wasn't court ordered, but I knew how sick I was. I knew how much pain and hurt I had suffered from. And I had to transform that energy and that time into my recovery. And that's what I had to do. I got a sponsor right away. I got engaged right away. Don't suggest that. He cheated on me. My sponsor relapsed, but I I continued sobriety. (laughs) That was my first year. I thought, well, if I can make it through that, I can make it through anything, right? Uh, I actually, I I met my ex-husband in 2001. I worked on a cruise ship because I had gone straight into social work, got really burned out, went and worked on a cruise ship. I had met my ex-husband. We wanted 10 children. We got married in 2003. We wanted 10 children. We started to practice and practice and practice. (laughs) In practice. And we weren't getting pregnant. And so years and years of uh, infertility treatments. And, and then finally I get pregnant. And it's twins. And I lose a twin. And that day was the day I, I truly I felt like I was broken. I really felt like I was a broken woman. Because here we didn't know it was a twin. Uh, We thought, okay, we went through years and years of fertility treatments. You know, I had like six years of sobriety. I was working full time in a drug treatment center. I'm giving, I'm helping people, I'm serving the Lord. And I can't get pregnant. And then I get pregnant. It's an ectopic pregnancy. So not only they tell me, okay, you're pregnant. Within 30 minutes, I remember in the elevator, they say, you're pregnant. It's in your tube. It exploded. You have internal bleeding and you're going to die unless we have emergency surgery. Uh, uh, whoa, 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 God, you, you didn't tell me this was going to happen. And, you know, I got I to gotta back up a little bit. Before, uh, during the fertility treatments, I had decorated one of our bedrooms into a nursery. And I used to sit in that bedroom in a rocking chair. And I used to act like I had a baby in my arms. And I used to say, thank you, God, for this baby. Thank you, God, for this child. And I, I remember I went to a garage sale, and I, I bought a stroller. I had a closet full of baby clothes. No baby. I bought a stroller at this garage sale, and the lady says, oh, are you pregnant? I said, yeah, I'm pregnant with God's promise. And she says, oh, <laughs> never heard that before. And so that's what I, that's what I was told to walk blindly in faith. And so that's what I was doing, is I was making room, I was making a room for God's promise. So I had a nursery, a nursery already, and then I'm told that the baby's in my tube, it ruptures, I have to have emergency surgery, all this, okay? Mind you, just before that, I had a cancerous tumor removed from my arm a month before this, okay? So I have the tumor removed, I had the ectopic pregnancy, major surgery, almost died, I'm like, okay, God, (laughs) really? Why? And I remember asking him, why, God? Why me? And he says, why not? Why not? You know, there's a saying that a lot of people actually misinterpret. Is it, people say that God only gives you so much that, you know, you can handle. Well, that's, that's a lie. I, I had talked to my friend who was dying of cancer, and she said, you know, a lot of people get it wrong. And they say, God only gives you as much as you can handle. No, that's not true. God gives you a lot more because then he can handle it. We have to rely on him. And so when I got into that victim mode, why me? Why me, God? And he says, why not you? (laughs) Why not you? You have me. You have me. 
And so I had to learn to be still. That's why I got it tattooed on my arm. <laughs> Psalm 4610, be still and know. I have ADHD. Be still is hard. <laughs> That's really hard for me to be still. But I have to have that right there to remind me, be still, Tina, and know. Know that God has it, that God is God. God's got it all. He's got it all planned. And it's great. It's a great, a great plan, an awesome plan. I love all of these, uh, the six reasons why you should trust God. He knows you by name. I love that. He knows you by name. Uh, he will fight for you. Absolutely, he will fight for you. Uh, he thinks about you. He has plans for you, Jeremiah 29, 11. When I had the ectopic pregnancy, I went home and I opened the Bible and there's Jeremiah 29, 11. And I just kept thinking, there's hope for me. There's hope. I know, God, you have hope for me. That there's, there's a future for me. You have plans for me, God. And I want to tell you that months later after that ectopic pregnancy, I found out I was pregnant. Now, here's immaculate conception for you. <laughs> We didn't have sex. <laughs> I'm sorry, TMI, but uh, we did not, you know, I had just had surgery. Here it was the twin of the baby I had lost. My son survived me having the tumor removed and his twin and that major surgery. My son survived all that. I remember going in to deliver him. I was in labor for a month. <laughs> they kept stopping my labor. They were like, no, 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 this is a new baby. This is not a twin because it's like over a million chances. I'm like, you don't know God. <laughs> you don't know God. You don't know my miracle maker. <laughs> and so I go in to deliver my son. And um, I'll never forget, they bring in the NICU equipment. And they're, this is, a, pre this is a, a premature baby. This is a premature baby. I said, no, I'm telling you, this is not a premature baby. And they're expecting this tiny little baby, and out comes my son, and he's eight pounds, four ounces, <laughs> peeling from head to toe, huge black curly afro. <laughs> I mean, he had so much hair. And they're looking at him, and he did not cry at all. I'm not kidding. He came out like this. <laughs> hey, it's about time. <laughs> And like I said, at 18 months old, he says to me, Mama, we need to talk about my life. And I said, wow, okay. And this is the same child that at five years old said, Mama, you gotta be like Peter and you gotta keep your eyes on Jesus or you're gonna fall into the water. This is the child that I, I pray with every morning. He's 15 years old, big old hairy hand, you know. I'm holding it right before I drop him off every morning. And I say, thank you, God, for Victor, because that's his name because he is victorious. So I love to share that story because that was a miracle. That is a total miracle. And, and I'm telling you, that's how good God is. Um, he is your refuge. He is always, always with you. Always with you. You know, I pray three times a day, in the morning, at night, and all day. <laughs> I have a constant communication with God. Uh, it's scary sometimes, you know. Okay, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> uh, so he's always, always with you. Um, this is a picture of me on the left side. This is the only picture I have of me when I was using alcohol and drugs. And if you can look in my eyes, I was just, I, I was lost. I was heartless. Uh, there was not much left of me. I really wanted to end my life at 23 years old when I finally had to accept I was an alcoholic and addict. Um, so on the left side, that uh, was at about 21 years old. And I'm telling you, I had done every crime. I should be in federal prison right now, to be honest. Uh, I had done every crime, but... You know, I, I, I uh, ran track in high school. I was really fast. Uh, and I ran from the police a lot of times, so I never got caught. But um, I, I had, uh, I, I didn't love that person. I didn't even care about that person. On the right-hand side, that's me. I was at an event talking about the recovery high school that I had started. Uh, because that's what God does is he takes our pain and he transforms it into our purpose. And that's exactly what he did is he took, he took my pain, he transformed it into his purpose. So throughout uh, 10 years, I had 11 surgeries. 
not just because of the fertility and all that stuff. I had a, a, just random stuff, 11 surgeries in 10 years. Every time I would try to get better and try to work out, and, and then, I, oh, I have another surgery. Oh, I have another surgery. One time I had surgery, uh, and I was off for six weeks, and that's how I wrote uh, three of my books, because <laughs> I have ADHD. <laughs> I can't just lay there and not do anything, right? Be still and write books. That's what it should say. <laughs> but I, I, I banged out three books, uh, just recovering from one of my surgeries. Because I thought, well, God, if you have me laying on my back and I'm looking to you, I might as well write some books, right? And so I'm a vessel, and I have him speak through me. And I got to tell you, it's so funny. My ex-husband used to laugh at me because every book that I wrote, I would get the book and I, I would open it, I'd start reading, and he'd go, well, well didn't you just write that book? No, the Holy Spirit wrote it. <laughs> I just let him borrow my name. <laughs> it's just my name on the front, but the Holy Spirit wrote it. To this day, I had an author contact me. She says, uh, Tina, can I quote your book in my book? I said, sure, what's the quote? She tells me, I said, oh, um, let me look that up. Are you sure I said that? <laughs> but yeah, thanks, you can quote me. But it's the Holy Spirit. You know, when you become an open, willing vessel, God will speak through you. And I encourage everybody to write a book. And you know, I actually, I was praying about this earlier. Um, actually, uh, yesterday, this saying, I spoke to hospice nurses. And, and I said this, it was in my devotional. I said this to them, and then I was praying about this. So maybe someone in here needs to hear this. I didn't cause it, I can't control it, I can't cure it. And, and when, if you are impacted by someone's addictions, I want you to remember that. You didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it, okay? Um, that's freeing. That is a freeing, freeing. When I finally learned that and, and to let go, you know, it's okay to care for people. You know, they say about, uh, in the Bible, it says about, uh, you know, helping your brother and your sister and that to lighten their load, but it also says cast your burdens on him. We're not to carry around everyone's stuff, you know. We're to cast our burdens to him. So, yeah, we can help one another, but guess what? We have to cast our burdens to God because he's going to take care of it. He's big enough. <laughs> He's big enough. Uh, one of my books, so this was my first book, Let Your Lessons Become Your Blessings. And this is why someone had said she is a voice of hope. Someone said, I'm medicine for the soul. Isn't that beautiful? I think it should be tweeted. Um, so Let Your Lessons Become Your Blessings. This, this book uh, took me 14 years to write. I wanted it to be a, from a place of healing, not a place of resentment or pain or, or hurt. Uh, and... Uh, this is a book that for every book I sell, I donate a book to a woman in drug treatment in the strip club ministry, which I used to do. <laughs> strip club ministry. Uh, <laughs> first time I ever went to a strip club. I was praying with the dancers. Uh, <laughs> um, a woman in um, <clears throat> drug treatment prison, jail. I have actually donated 472 of these books. And I got to laugh because on social media, one of my friends took a picture of my book. She says, I know this author, and she puts it on social media. I said, oh, where are you? Are you, are you at Walmart? Are you at Barnes & Noble? She said, no, I'm at Goodwill. <laughs> because when you donate books to women in prison or jail or drug treatment or strip clubs, some of them just, you know. I'm going to try to think that maybe they read it and they just wanted to pass it on. <laughs> But hey, you know, I always encourage them, hey, if you're not going to read it, you can always sell it on eBay and get, you know, five cents. <laughs> so <clears throat> this, Let Your Forgiveness Become Your Freedom, that is the worst selling book ever. <laughs> Nobody wants to forgive. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, actually, since I've been doing that joke, I've sold a lot of them. <laughs> so it worked. But um, Let Your Forgiveness Become Your Freedom. Uh, this is a book because I had to learn how to forgive myself. That was the hardest part. I could forgive other people, you and you and you. But to forgive myself and then forgive God, whoo, that's a toughie. So uh, let your forgiveness become your freedom. Uh, preventing burnout, igniting passion. Um, th this, is a, this is a book that is really popular because I've worked over 22 years in social work and juvenile justice. Uh, so those of us that work in fields where we help people, we get burned out a lot of times, especially if you're in ministry. And I'm going to teach you a two-letter word. 
No. <laughs> it's okay to say no. We have to take care of ourselves. If we pour into other people, we have to fill ourselves up. Or we can't pour into any, anyone else. So even Jesus rested, right? So did Lazarus for a couple days. Uh, the other book I have is A Heartbeat of a Real Leader. This was my fifth book I wrote, my most professional book. And, uh, and, and so this is really popular for professional development and ministry leaders as well. And uh, so what I really want to share with you is um, this, this, oh, this heavy, this heavy metal. <laughs> so um, 20 years ago, I was always very athletic. 20 years ago, I had this dream of being in a bodybuilding competition and I just couldn't eat right. Uh, I, I was on this, you know, food plan where I would have a salad and then two Reese's peanut butter cups. I just could not eat right. And it, my personal trainer says, you know, Tina, um, if you want to get into bodybuilding, you have to eat healthy. <laughs> oh, I can't have peanut butter cups. <laughs> and, and so I, I said, oh, wow, I'm just not ready to, for that commitment. And so he says, well, I don't want you to waste your time or your money. And I was like, okay, well, then I'm not going to, you know, work for this. And so that was 20 years ago. Um, Ten years ago, I started to work out again. I got another personal trainer. Guess what he told me? He's like, you have to eat healthy. Abs are made in the kitchen. That's what he said. I said, well, I'm not ready for that commitment. Jeez, people. He says, well, I don't want you to waste your time and money. <sighs> All right. And so I carried on and I gained a bunch of weight and I ate peanut butter cups and everything else you can think of. And then September of last year, I started to fast. And guess what I fasted from? <laughs> sugar. Because I was using sugar like I was using all of my other addictions. Okay? Instead of going straight to God, I would go for sugar. I'd eat a donut. So September 27th, I gave up sugar last year and... <clears throat> I started to fast because I was going through some things with my husband at the time. And, and God made it very clear to me what I needed to do. And I filed for divorce in October. And that was the hardest thing. Married for 17 and a half years, I gave 110% to my marriage every day. But I had a pastor say to me that if your marriage is not evenly yoked and you don't have a spiritual leader in the house, you have no one to submit to. And so I prayed about it, and God confirmed to me, and he's confirmed time and time again that that was the right decision uh, for me to get divorced. Actually, uh, when we sat down our son to tell him we were getting divorced, he says, it's about time. Yeah, it's about time. So, you know, we were thinking, that, oh, that magic age of 18, we'll just wait until our, my son is 18, and, and then we'll get divorced. And, and he's 15, and he knew, he knew, and he loves it now. He loves because he gets quality time with his dad and he gets quality time with his mom. And, and so it, it's all good, but it was still very, very rough. I, I, there's nothing that, pl that you could plan uh, for what you're going to go through when it comes to a divorce. It was very rough. And so what I did is I thought, okay, what do I have control over? I have control over what I put in my mouth, right? Uh, I have control over what I do with my body. You know, there's a pandemic going on. A lot of people are gaining weight. And what do I do? I start eating healthy, not eating sugar, and I start working out. And so I'm happy to say January, uh, July 31st, I competed in my first bodybuilding competition. It was the old ladies category, 40, 45 plus. <laughs> and, uh, and this is my medal. And on the back, it says uh, sixth place. I was sixth place um, out of six. <laughs> I usually don't say that. Can you edit that out? <laughs> when, I, when I told everyone, I was like, I'm put it on social media on Facebook. Oh, yay, I got a medal. They're like, what place? Sixth place. Oh, out of how many? 150 competitors. <laughs> Only six in my category, but. Anyways, I, you know what? I won the minute I got on that stage. 
that I won because I took control of what I put in my pie hole. <laughs> I took control of what I put in my mouth. I, I had cut out sugar. I had, um, you know, really been disciplined in, in what I was feeding my temple. So what I did is I actually realized what I was doing was I was matching the strength that I've had inside me to the strength on the outside. That's what I was finally doing in my life. My next competition is December 4th, so I'm super excited. Okay, I, I see the time. I know I'm sticking to your agenda. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm so grateful. I have 23 years of recovery, 23 years without alcohol and drugs. That's by the grace of God. By the grace of God. Did my plan go exactly how I planned it? <laughs> Did my life go like how I, I planned? No, absolutely not. I remember in high school, my girlfriend saying, who do you think is going to be the first one married? Tina. Who do you think is going to be the first one with kids? Tina. Who do you think is not going to go to college? Tina. Well, guess what? I, out of all my friends, I was the one to get married last. I was the one to have only one child uh, and barely you know, squeeze that one out. And, and then I, I, was, I, I actually got six years of college, and I actually am um, you know, very successful in my profession. I want to share with you that, um, real quick, uh, I, I opened a recovery high school, the first recovery high school in Tampa Bay. And it is for teenagers struggling with addictions. I want to share with you, real quick, if it's okay with you, um, this is, so it's called Victory High School, named after my son. And uh, he helped me name it, of course. Uh, he helped me pick out the logo. He helped me pick out everything, the colors. He helped me uh, with everything. And, and he helped me with this victorious creed. And so every day we do a mental health check-in to start off. Because our priority, our number one goal is to keep our students alive. I don't know if you know there's an opioid epidemic. There's a drug epidemic. And they're, it's killing our, our teenagers. Um, so number one, I want to keep our students alive. Number two, I want to emotionally and mentally stabilize our students. And then number three, me they'll learn something, <laughs> okay? Um, and this is the victorious creed. This is what we actually say together every morning. This is them saying it. The victorious creed, recovery is possible. I deserve to be healthy. I deserve to be healthy. I am worthy of a positive life. I can accept my limitations, but I will not be defined by it. I can accept my limitations, but will not be defined by it. I belong here, a safe place of hope, healing, and second chances. I belong here, a safe place of hope, healing, and second chances. I am compassionate, caring, and lovable. I am compassionate, caring, and lovable. I am not a label or diagnosis. I am not a label or diagnosis. Today. I want, to live. Today, I want to live. Today I can feel true freedom from all substances. Today I can feel true freedom from all substances. I am victorious. I am victorious. Oh come on, say it. <laughs> say it like you mean it. <laughs> I am victorious. I <laughs> That's, that's what we do every day. And I want to share with you that one of the students, he's 15 years old, and the first day of school, he was vomiting so violently on the playground. And he was so angry from, from withdrawal of substances. He was punching the concrete, and blood was splattering everywhere. This young man had relapsed again just recently. And so I was checking in on him, and his mom had to come to pick him up because he was vomiting again. And, and he's crying on the car ride home, and he says, Mama, I just don't know why Miss Tina loves me so much. And I, I, I can feel that because that was me. I remember thinking, like, I just don't understand how God can love me so much. Why he loves me so much. But he does. My young lady that you heard her voice there, she's 17 years old and she's a survivor of the foster care system. Lots of trauma, lots of abuse. And uh, she says to me, two weeks into this school, they are, the, both of them started in April. 
And she says to me, Miss Tina, Victory High School makes me want to live. Wow. You know, God took that, that, lo- that lost woman that, that, that felt broken and, and like a loser, and, and he's using me to help these teenagers, to give them a little bit of hope, and that there's hope for healing. Healed people heal people. And so uh, I, I share that with you because um, th- that's our purpose. That's exactly, you know, God takes our pain and he transforms it into our purpose. Um, so I do have my books over here. I, I would love for you to come over um, and um, I, I accept cash, checks, chocolate. Um, <laughs> children, if you have any. I love children. Uh, I, also, I also have some CDs. I have um, Michael W. Smith. Um, I have uh, Kirk Franklin. I have <laughs> Matthew West. If anyone wants to buy <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but I thank you all so very much. And just remember, the truth is there is hope. Thank you.